part of the answer, says Nietzsche, is biological. All of organic nature is divided into two broad species types, those animals that are naturally herd animals and those that are naturally loners, those that are prey and those that are predators. Some animals are by nature sheep, field mice, or cows, and some animals by nature are wolves, hawks, or lions. Psychologically and physically, this divide also runs right through the human species. Some people are born fearful and inclined to join a herd, and some are born fearless and inclined to seek lonely heights. Some of us are born sedentary and sluggish, and some of us are born crackling with purpose and craving adventure. Some of us, to use Nietzsche's language, are born to be slaves, and some are born to be masters. And which type you are, there's little you can do about it. There is a brute biological fact here. Each of us is the product of a long line of evolution, and our traits are evolutionarily bred into us. Just as a sheep cannot help but be sheepish, and a hawk cannot help but be hawkish, each of us inherits from our parents and from their parents before them a long line of inbuilt traits. Quote, it cannot be erased from a man's soul what his ancestors have preferably and most constantly done. The master types live by strength, creativity, independence, assertiveness, and related traits. They respect power, courage, boldness, risk-taking, even recklessness. It is natural for them to follow their own path no matter what, to rebel against social pressure and conformity. The slave types live in conformity. They tend to passivity, dependence, meekness. It is natural for them to stick together for a sense of security, just as herd animals do. Now, says Nietzsche, let's talk about morality, about good and bad, right and wrong. For a long time, we have been taught that morality is a matter of religious commandments set in stone thousands of years ago. Not so, says Nietzsche. What we take to be moral depends on our biological nature, and different biological natures dictate different moral codes. Think of it this way. If you are a sheep, then what will seem good to you as a sheep? Being able to graze peacefully, sticking close together with others just like you, being part of the herd and not straying off. What will seem bad to you? Well, wolves will seem bad, and anything wolf-like, predatory, aggressive. But what if you are a wolf? Then strength, viciousness, and contempt for the sheep will come naturally to you and seem good. There's nothing the wolves and the sheep can agree upon morally. Their natures are different, as are their needs and goals, as is what feels good to them. Of course, it would be good for the sheep if they could convince the wolves to be more sheep-like, but what self-respecting wolf would fall for that? Quote, that lambs dislike great birds of prey does not seem strange. Only it gives no grounds for reproaching these birds of prey for bearing off little lambs. And if the lambs say among themselves, These birds of prey are evil, and whoever is least like a bird of prey, but rather its opposite, a lamb, would he not be good? There is no reason to find fault with this institution of an ideal, except perhaps that the birds of prey might view it a little ironically and say, we don't dislike them at all, these good little lambs. We even love them. Nothing is more tasty than a tender lamb. Unquote. The same point holds for humans. The divide between strong and weak, assertive and timid, runs right through the human species. The key question to ask about morality is not, is such and such a value universally and intrinsically good? Rather, the question is, what kind of person finds this value to be valuable? In Nietzsche's words, one's moral code is a, quote, decisive witness to who he is, to the, quote, innermost drives of his nature, unquote. Moral judgments, Nietzsche says, are, quote, symptoms and sign languages which betray the process of physiological prosperity or failure, unquote. So, One's moral code is a function of one's psychological makeup, and one's psychological makeup is a function of one's biological makeup. 
The biological language and examples of those quotations show that biology is crucial to Nietzsche's views on morality. Nietzsche was a precocious 15 years old when Charles Darwin's book on the origin of species was published in 1859. Evolutionary ideas had been in the air for a long time before Darwin, and much of the intellectual world was moving away from thinking of reality in terms of timeless, unchanging absolutes to viewing it in terms of process and change. All of this applies to morality, too. Moral codes, Nietzsche is suggesting, are part of a biological type's life strategy of survival. And the more you look at the history of morality evolutionarily and biologically, the more you are struck by the diversity of circumstances and how beliefs about values have changed dramatically across time. This is precisely our key problem, culturally, Nietzsche argues. The evidence shows that we used to prize excellence and power and to look down upon the humble and the lowly. Now the meek, the common man, the kindly neighbor are the good guys, while the aggressive, the powerful, the strong, the proud are evil. Think of it this way. Suppose I gave you the following list of traits and urged them upon you positively. It is good to be proud of yourself, to have a healthy sense of self-esteem. Wealth is good for it gives you the power to live as you wish. Be ambitious and bold and seek your highest dream. Don't take any nonsense from other people. Make it clear that you will take vengeance and exact justice against those who mess with you. Seek to improve your life and only devote yourself to things that will profit you. Don't waste your time or resources. Seek great challenges, great pleasures, including sensual pleasures of the body, and go your own independent way in life, embracing whatever risks you must to develop a full and realized sense of yourself as an individual. And when you accomplish something great, admire yourself for what you have done, and indulge yourself in the rewards that greatness deserves. Pride, self-esteem, wealth, ambition, boldness, vengeance, justice, profit, challenge, pleasure, sensuality, independence, risk, individualism, admiration of self, indulgence. Now consider the elements of that list together as a package. Does that list resonate with you? Do you feel in your bones that if more people lived this way, they would live more active, fuller lives, and that they and the human species would realize its highest potential? Now consider a different list of traits, and let me urge them upon you positively, too. One should be humble, for pride goeth before the fall. The meek shall inherit the earth, and blessed are the poor. As for wealth and the rich, it shall be easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. Instead of seeking profit, one should sacrifice and give to charity, be patient and forgiving, turn the other cheek, be aware of one's weaknesses and sins, and be ashamed and self-deprecating as a result. Practice self-restraint, particularly with respect to your lower, impure, and often disgusting physical desires. Play it safe. Think of other people's needs, and don't rock the boat, and realize that we are all dependent upon each other. Obey your parents and your preacher and the politicians. Does that description resonate with you? Do you feel that if more people lived that way, they would live better lives and that they and the human species would realize its highest potential? A table, master traits contrasted to slave traits. Masters, proud, self-esteem, slaves, humility, pride goeth before the fall. Master, bold, slaves, the meek shall inherit the earth. Masters, rich, slaves, blessed are the poor. Masters, wealth, slaves, it shall be easier for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle. Masters, profit, slaves, sacrifice, charity. Master, ambition, slave, patience. Master, vengeance, slave, forgiveness. Master, justice. Slave, turn the other cheek. Master, sense of self-worth. Slave, weakness, sinfulness. Master, 
admiration of self, slave, shame, master, indulgence, slave, self-restraint, master, sensuality, slave, disgust at the physical, master, challenge, slave, safety, master, individualism, slave, don't rock the boat, master, independence, slave, dependence, master, autonomy, slave, obedience. Nietzsche is crystal clear about the slave set of concepts. That list is dangerous to human potential. It reeks of weakness, even sickness and unhealthiness. It undermines the human potential for greatness, and it is tragically the dominant morality of our time. In our time, the traits that ennoble man are condemned, and all the traits that weaken man are praised. Morality, as Nietzsche puts it paradoxically, has become a bad thing. Morality has become immoral. Quote, Precisely morality would be to blame if the highest power and splendor actually possible to the type man was never in fact attained. So that precisely morality was the danger of dangers.